video is going to talk about the populist era, which we started to talk about in class, but this is going to give us a more thorough overview, um, just because a class always tends to run by quickly. So the populist era. In general, the populist party is a very uh, left-leaning party. It caters towards the interests of the everyday individual. Um, as we discussed in class, many farmers are very much attracted to populism. And then when we get to the urban areas, we're also going to see a lot of populists who also in in general are disgruntled with capitalism. They don't like the railroads um, and they don't like big businesses. So populists are sort of a conglomeration of working class people nationwide. Um, a lot of them are going to come from the Democratic Party. We're going to see that when we get to the 1896 election that actually the populists are going to kind of steal the Democrats' thunder, sort of. Um, but then ultimately we're going to see that the uh, Democratic Party kind of absorbs populist interests. So we'll get there when we talk about that election. So first, let's think about uh, where the farmers factor into the populist party. <clears throat> so as we were discussing in class, farmers were having quite a bit of difficulty in the late 19th century. Um, with the development of agribusiness, um, there's these huge, I would call them bonanza farms, right, that are emerging um, that are very, very difficult for small farmers to compete with, right? Um, basically, what happens with the development of agribusiness is that, you know, larger farms obviously can produce more and smaller farmers find that the only way that they can try to compete in the market is to also produce more goods. But the problem is that with agribusiness, there all of a sudden is the cultivation of so many crops that the prices are going to go down. Um, so ultimately, um, overproduction is going to be a major problem that uh, small farmers are going to have to cope with. Um, another thing that's happening is that, you know, since prices a lot of times are going down when uh, when agricultural production uh, increases, farmers suddenly are unable to pay off their mortgages. Um, realize that, you know, they had they had a certain amount, a fixed amount of money that they had to pay, and uh, that banks didn't necessarily care if suddenly that their revenue was not coming in. Um, so what was, it was really problematic when the prices of crops kept dropping, farmers found it increasingly difficult to actually pay banks back for their mortgages, right? So that's really, really problematic. and. And uh, farmers find that banks aren't really cutting them a break. <clears throat> Another thing that's huge, one of the major reasons why they're getting into populism is because they really don't like the railroads. Um, shipping rates are very expensive for small farmers. Realize also that small farmers a lot of times don't get the best land locations, so a lot of times they're in really remote areas. And uh, if you have to ship your goods by train, you have to pay more if the train has to go farther to you. Um, so it's really expensive to ship goods to these rem remote locations. And the other thing is, going back to the Bonanza farms again, larger farms actually got rebates a lot of times from railroads because they had huge shipments. So small farmers aren't getting this. Um, so because of that, what we're going to see is that small farmers are also losing out because they have less competitive shipping rates, um, but they need the money arguably a lot more than large farms because they can't produce as much um, so that's very problematic. And then, of course, there are the unavoidable problems with the weather and, uh, and, uh, and pests. I just realized, wow, nice typo there. Um, so with weather, uh, you had very devastating droughts um, that obviously would affect crop yields. And there were several winters in the late 19th century that uh, resulted in massive blizzards that really put an interruption in uh, in farming, so that was problematic. You also have uh, pest damage. This is before we have, for better or for worse, um, the use of uh, pesticides on farms. So you had, you know, pests like grasshoppers damage crops, and it was really difficult for farmers to make up for that. Um, and then one of the huge problems is that the government really, uh, in the early stages of the populist era, the government isn't doing much to give farmers any aid if they are struggling financially. And also, uh, the government does not really want to step in and regulate businesses like railroads. So as far as uh, the common people are concerned, the government is preferring these large-scale businesses, business owners, and not the common man. So we see a little bit of changes with that. Um, we discussed in class Munn versus Illinois. So in 1877, the Supreme Court actually ruled in favor of Granger laws that were passed already. The Granger laws were setting railroad prices, um, and they also were uh, setting uh, storage prices. 
and that was a really major success for the Grangers. And so in 1877, the Supreme Court actually upholds um, something that favors the grazer, grazers. But then unfortunately, um, nine years after that, the court reverses the Munn decision with Wabash versus Illinois. And uh, what that does is it essentially limits uh, the state's powers to regulate businesses. But it's not completely for naught because after Wabash versus Illinois, there is this demand um, for the federal government to produce some sort of uh, uh, some sort of agency to regulate businesses. And so instead of actually having the states regulate businesses, the ICC is created. And what that does is it leads the federal government to regulate businesses. So basically, you know, Munn allows the states to do it. Wabash takes the state's ability to regulate away. But then the ICC allows the federal government to regulate businesses. The problem, though, is that uh, the ICC is pretty limited in its ability to regulate businesses, um, and uh, so that you know, it's it's not a perfect fix. I'm going to skip the silver issue because I actually cover it in a future slide. Um, so in general. Um, the origins of populism a lot of people see in rural areas. Like I was saying, farmers are very much struggling financially, and you can see this in this graph, right? Notice that in the uh, years after the Civil War, and if this graph actually extended uh, further back in time, you might see an even farther upward trend, right? Everything that is blue shows us that farmers ultimately are getting, uh, getting very good prices for the products, um, and they're getting better prices than what they pay. So basically, that means that they're generating a profit, obviously a good thing. Every year in red, you actually see that farmers are working at a deficit, right? Basically, they're paying more for their supplies, things like tools, things like seeds. If they have to employ people, they're paying their laborers. Basically, their costs um, are outweighing the actual money that they're getting in. So you see that farmers are definitely um, getting into considerable debt. Um, this is no surprise here because this is right after the Panic of 1873. And then notice in the 1880s, all the way up to the 1910s, you're going to have major farmer deficits. Um, so the populist era is going to, well, when the People's Party forms, it's going to start to address some farmers' issues. Um, also with the progressive era, we'll notice that there's, um, that also helps farmers. But then, uh, honestly, one of the biggest boons to farming production is going to be World War I, when farmers uh, have to produce not only for the United States, but also for Europe, because they're so war-torn, war -torn, rather, that they can't produce any agricultural products themselves. So anyway, that gives us an illustration of how bad things were for the farmers. Let's first talk about the Grangers. Um, in class, we discussed them a little bit, but just as a recap, um, the Grangers were um, first organized in the 1870s, and they tended to be in areas that were very full of farmers, right? So not surprisingly, Midwest, the South, there were a lot of Grangers in Texas as well. And one of the things that they do is they set up co-ops. Um, so basically what that means is that Granges, um, so basically uh, these local organizations called Granges, um, got together and they made sure that they all had similar prices, right? They wanted to make sure that no one farmer was charging way less for a certain commodity. And also they wanted to make sure that no one farmer was overproducing any product. One of the huge problems that got farmers into this mess was overproduction and lack of communication. So with co-ops, basically, it meant that they could control production more effectively, they could control prices more effectively, and furthermore, they were working together rather than competing against one another, which ultimately tended to get them in trouble, right? So the co-ops are huge. Um, also, you're gonna see that the Grange, Grangers are um, not just political in nature, in fact, they're not really trying to form into a political party, per se, that happens later. Um, but they also are really interested in um, in trying to unite uh, people who live in remote areas, realize that you know the Granges aren't living in urban areas, and so there is this effort to um, uh, organize socially. There's an effort to uh, get farmers together and uh, put together uh, educational efforts for them, right? Getting them uh, up to speed in the latest agricultural methods, the latest tools, right? Um, new technologies. So it's not educational in a schooling sense, but it's more education. Um, directed specifically towards farmers, right? So this is one way that they kind of feel united um, when they previously felt alienated by um, by the fact that they were living in such isolated communities and they definitely felt removed from the government. So this gives them more of a sense of community. 
Um, like we said in class, one of the huge things is that uh, the Grangers actually get together and they lobby really heavily for a series of laws that are passed in the 1870s uh, called the Granger Laws. And um, what they do is they set uh, maximum prices for railroads uh, to charge them for transportation, and they also set maximum prices for grain storage. And the other thing is that grangers eventually are going to actually set up their own grain elevators so they don't have to work with outside businesses. And uh, additionally, some of them are going to start to produce their own farming equipment. And that's a big deal because that was something that came at a very high price for farmers, right? If you want to buy a tractor, a plow, anything like that, if you can produce it yourself, you're going to save a ton of money. If they have to buy it from an outside organization, then they can inflate the price or they can set a price that's too high based on how little money a farmer might be making, right? If it's a drought, they still need supplies, but they can't actually purchase them, right? So that's going to help them. But the problem is that the Grangers actually declined pretty rapidly in the, in the 1870s, and there's a reason for that. One is that um, ultimately what we're going to see is that um, there's going to be, well, after the Panic of 1873, you're going to see that the government is going to be less interested in helping uh, farmers specifically. Um, also, another reason why it rapidly declines is because uh, it's going to, um, it eventually is going to be absorbed by the Farmers Alliance, which arguably is um, is even stronger because it has more of a political component. So the Grangers don't last long, um, but at the same time, they leave a pretty long lasting legacy because they segue into the Farmers Alliances, which are very significant. So yeah, Grangers don't last long, but it's okay. Um, I think I already talked about Munn versus Illinois and Wabash, but just remember Munn versus Illinois is a really significant accomplishment for the Grangers, right? It allows states to regulate um, businesses like railroads, but then Wabash makes it go away, right? Because ultimately now the states don't have the ability to regulate railroads, but don't forget that the ICC is created after the Wabash decision, which allows the federal government to regulate businesses. All right, so moving on to the Farmers Alliance. All right, so what the Farmers Alliance is, is, um, is a, it's larger than the Granges, right? They're organized on a much larger regional basis, right? You basically have, um, you have two major farmers alliances, the Southern Alliance and then the Northern Alliance, right? So the Southern Alliance is mainly Texas, but other Southern states. And then the Midwest makes up the Northern Alliance, the Great Plains region. And so like this says, it's built upon the ashes of the Grange. The Grange movement was failing in the late 1870s due to economic problems, um, due to the fact that the, um, that they were not, necessarily politically organized enough to stay intact. Um, so what happens is that the Farmers Alliance is going to come along and actually be much more political in nature than the Granges. So they're not putting together educational efforts or maybe organizing in social settings, but at the same time, the Farmers Alliances are actually going to take candidates and push them into office, right? They're going to be people who actually campaign for office as, as Farmers Alliance candidates, right? So the fact that they're actually supporting people who are running for government positions shows us that the Farmers Alliances are taking it one step further. They're not just organizing, but they're actually moving towards gaining representation in government. And they really, they have more, um, they have a pretty significant influence uh, at the state level. And you do actually, by the 1890s, you start to have some influence at the federal level. Um, so you're going to have a lot of farmers actually get elected into office in both the state legislature and even in Congress. Um, you're never going to have a farmer alliance member actually become elected president, but you will have populists run for president. And what we're going to see in a minute is that the, what used to be the Grangers and then what becomes the Farmers Alliance, that eventually is going to segue into, um, the populist party, right? Um, this just shows us that eventually the Northern and Southern Alliance is going to merge. Um, so it's going to be basically a nationwide organization. And that gives us a, that gives it a lot of political strength. So in 1889, both of the alliances merge. And that's when they really can make some political headway and actually elect people into office. But despite the fact that farmers are making a little bit of progress, realize that other workers in other parts of the country are still very much struggling. And this is indicative, indicative not only of the problems with the Gilded Age that we already discussed, but this is one of the major reasons why we're moving towards um, the populist party, right? They feel like they can't just strike. They can't just organize labor unions. They actually need to play the political game. They need to have their own party because at that point, they don't feel like the Democrats or the Republicans are actually doing enough to represent the interests of the common man, right? 
1887, or 1877 rather, you have a great railroad strike. Um, some, some call it the Great Uprising of 1877. But what it is is really the first nationwide uh, strike in U.S. history. And so it starts in West Virginia, and it's a protesting of urban and industrial workers uh, because they got a wage cut. And so um, what happens is that they protest so successfully that it, they actually shut down the railroads, not only where they start, not only in Virginia, West Virginia, rather, but eventually this great uprising is going to turn into a nationwide strike and railroads all across the country are going to get shut down because the workers are going to refuse to work until their wages are restored. So it goes from a strike at a very local level in West Virginia to one that is nationwide. People who work for railroads all over the place are stopping working. So it's really significant because it shows you a lot of collaboration between workers across the country. Right? You could see it as a sympathy strike to a certain extent. Right, They're just joining forces, but that obviously is going to give it more strength, and it's going to make the federal government actually listen because they obviously can't operate without the railroads. It's going to stop mail from circulating. It's very problematic. So what's going to happen, not surprisingly, is that eventually federal troops are going to be called in to stop the Great Uprising. It did become violent at times. Um, and... Uh, the uprising eventually stops. There are many victims. There are about 100 people that are killed while the federal troops are actually in there stopping, um, stopping the Great Uprising. And what's even more significant is that after the Great Uprising is over, um, there is this need to have a more uh, organized and permanent uh, force that can stop up uprisings like this. So it's actually as a result of the great uprising of 1877 that the National Guard is created, right? And we talk about the National Guard quite frequently still, right? If you think about the protests in Ferguson, for example, the National Guard was called in. Think about it like a federally funded uh, riot police. So that was brand new before the uh, great uprising of 1877. And even though this uprising eventually is stopped by, uh, by the federal government, um, what's more important is the legacy that it leaves. So what happens is that even though workers technically lose this battle, afterwards they organize into even stronger unions. And um, they still very often resort to strikes. Um, and then they also increasingly are creating political parties that are organized around labor, right? So labor parties. Um, and even though they don't have success at the presidential front, they do have other successes that are notable. So one of them is this guy down here, Henry George. Um, he runs uh, as a Labor Party candidate. So not Democrat, not Republican. There's a brand new party. He runs as a Labor Party candidate for mayor of New York City. And uh, despite the fact that uh, many historians argue that Tammany Hall was messing with this election, they were throwing ballots in the Hudson River, despite all of that, Henry George came in second in this election. So this is really big because it shows us how much the Labor Party has grown, right? Laborers are now directly influencing politics, whereas, you know, uh, prior to this time period, they had very little influence in politics whatsoever. So this is kind of seen as a threat to the more entrenched uh, political machines run by groups like Tammany Hall. They don't get... They don't ever get to the presidential level, but at the same time, at the very least, they are forcing the establishment parties to listen more to the labor unions and the common people because they are obviously not happy. And so by the late 1880s, you're going to see labor parties win seats on many city councils and state legislatures. Um, and this is going to be even more common in industrial er areas where workers uh, outnumber other classes. Um, but nonetheless, um, this doesn't completely solve everything. You still see that there are instances of strikes uh, I did not put the homestead strike on this just because we already discussed it in class, but I'm going to make sure that you have all of my chapter notes um, so that you feel comfortable with all these different strikes. But the Pullman is one that we did not talk about in class, so let me give you an idea of what happens here. This is in Illinois, Pullman, Illinois. So this is a railroad company. Um, the Pullman Railroad Company, uh, they made uh, luxury sleeper cars. And it was one of those self-contained uh, factory towns. So if you lived in Pullman, Illinois, and you worked for the railroad, you had to shop at the company store. Um, your housing was provided, but your rent was deducted from your paycheck. Um, all the you know all the stores, everything was owned by Pullman. Um, and basically, yeah, you didn't really have the independence to kind of shop on your own um, and really leave the town that subjected you to constant supervision. One other really interesting thing about the Pullman area is that uh, they did not build any taverns or saloons in their town, so that's 
kind of deliberate. They want to make sure that their workers don't drink because they feel like that might lend itself towards uh, uprisings and unrest, right? So basically what ends up happening is that um, workers really very much resent their lack of freedom. And then the company decides uh, in 1898 to cut, rate, uh, cut the wages of the people. But the problem is it doesn't lower anything else. So there's this wage cut, but uh, workers are still expected to pay the same prices for food and rent. And that's really problematic because they don't have any choice as to where they can shop. Um, so what's going to happen is they're going to strike. Um, this strike, just like the Greed Uprising in 1877, becomes nationwide. So many railroad workers throughout the country engage in what we call sympathy strikes. Basically, they're laying down and stopping working, too, because they agree with the cause of the people in Pullman. Um, the strikes were actually largely nonviolent, um, but there was a claim made that they were disrupting the mail delivery. Um, so because of that, the federal government again intervenes. So Grover Cleveland is president at this point. And he sends in uh, federal troops to try to stop the strike, and a number of strikers actually are killed in the process. So even if it started out in a nonviolent way, eventually the government will intervene and it will become violent. And it finally ends when the um, leader of the American Railway, Railway Union, his name is Eugene V. Debs, he's down here. He's a very important uh, early socialist in U.S. history. He's going to get arrested. So when he, as basically the leader of this strike, when he gets arrested, that causes the Pullman strike to end. But at the same time, Eugene V. Debs becomes even more well-known, actually, when he's behind bars. So his jail time leads him to embrace socialism, and eventually he's actually going to run as president on the socialist ticket. So it really shows us how far the country is going in terms of paying attention to laborers if, the social, if socialism was actually a viable political party at one point in U.S. history. And uh, even though Pullman is over, we're going to see that there are going to be bitter confrontations that continue between federal troops and workers uh, throughout the country. A lot of them happen in urban areas, so it's not over by any means, but still progress, right? More, you know, these issues are actually being addressed by political parties, finally. Another thing, um, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the fact that women get very involved in the populist movement. Um, so we already discussed the fact that the Knights of Labor did not exclude anyone. So many women got involved in the Knights of Labor. Um, and um, they attended the um, Knights of Labor National Convention. And they actually did things to um, that kind of added a unique feminine edge, I guess one could say, to... Um, to the Knights of Labor organization. A lot of times they would have like baking cooperatives, they would run daycare centers for workers. They knew that it was really important for workers to uh, collaborate and they, they all had common, they all had common problems. Uh, so, you know, ultimately just doing little things to try to help the worker caring for children, giving them food was helpful. Um, also, women you're going to find are really active in the Grange and Farmers Alliance movements. movements. But then women are also going to take a unique approach towards the populist era that isn't necessarily completely um, oriented around labor, um, but it's sort of a byproduct of some of the other problems that are associated with, um, with labor in the late 19th century. So one of the huge things that's happening in the late 19th century is there's, it's, there's this increased awareness of the problems of alcohol. Now, because the working class is in such, a, uh, such an unfavorable position, um, and because cities uh, oftentimes have many saloons, opportunities for gambling, many sort of vice activities, um, middle class women start to take it upon themselves to find some sort of way to try to get people to abstain from alcohol consumption. In their minds, alcohol consumption does nothing but bad things. It is leading to more problems like crime and domestic violence. And so what happens is you're actually going to have um, one woman, Frances Willard, who uh, founds an organization called the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, we can abbreviate it as the WCTU. And uh, this is significant because, again, it's really pushing towards people uh, to abstain from alcohol consumption. And it is really popular. So nearly um, a million women actually um, mobilize to uh, promote the WCTU. Uh, um, they're also not only working towards temperance, but a lot of temperance uh, a lot of temperance supporters also are really active in the suffrage movement. So you're going to see that, um, um, that these two movements very much overlap with one another. Um, in a lot of ways, they're pushed towards kind of reforming society and making it more pure 
was a way that they felt like they could justify getting the vote. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union also was trying to work towards racial uplift. Um, they allowed African American women to join, which uh, is significant because there were a lot of organizations that were still racist in nature, but the WCTU was not one of them. Um, what else, what else, what else? Also, another organization that forms in 1890 is the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. Um, this is... Um, going to show us that women are, at this point, definitely going beyond just labor reform. They are pushing not just for fair pay, better working hours. They're not pushing against child labor. They're, they're doing all of that, but now they want to take it one step further and advocate for their own right to vote. Um, so this is very significant, and we know that, finally, 30 years after this, they will get what they want um, so the fact that women are getting involved in the labor union in a lot of ways empowers them to try to fight for other things like voting. Um, the problem is that in the 1890s, their efforts to get suffrage are kind of minimally successful. The only uh, state where women actually get voting rights in the 1890s is Colorado. And the reason why that is, is because Colorado did not have a particularly large population. So by enfranchising the women, it actually made Colorado stronger um, voting wise. So sort of a double-edged sword there. Um, the Christian community is also getting really, really involved in uh, the populist era. Um, they preach the idea of the social gospel. We've talked quite a bit about gospels, the gospel of wealth, the gospel of work. The social gospel was a Christian ideal. It was uh, led originally by a minister named uh, Washington Gladden. And basically the social gospel meant that Christians should apply their own teachings to fight social problems, right? So the idea is, you know, providing charity, helping those who are less fortunate, right? Very general in their mind Christian practices that they could implement to try to help people who are less fortunate than they were. Um, a lot of people started to call for their churches to fight against injustice. This is one of the uh, main times when we start to get churches really actively involved in helping the community. Now we have this all the time. We have things like clothing and food drives. This was something that was relatively new in these communities um, before the populist era, right? So it's really, really taking it upon the, com the church community to actually help, um, help people who are suffering, right? In their mind, they have to do that in addition towards trying to get the government involved because the government is not necessarily as accountable. They want to take the issues into their own hands. Um, they definitely do have uh, an emphasis on ending child labor, and they also want to have civil service reform, which we know happens. We talked about the Pendleton Civil Service Act uh, in class today, so you know those are some of the things that they advocate. Um, one thing that's interesting is that Catholics actually are a little bit less involved in this social gospel movement because Catholics actually believed a lot of times that poverty was a natural part of the social order. But you are going to see some Catholics um, break away from this idea, and uh, largely it's immigrant Catholics. And that's probably not that surprising because, um, because immigrants tend to fight for, uh, they're, they're definitely uh, sort of vying for the lower paying jobs. Um, so immigrant Catholics actually tend to be more active in the social gospel movement and trying to help out um, communities of those less fortunate. Um, you're also going to have the creation of uh, religious groups specifically for women. Um, so the YWCA or the Young Women's Christian Association is one of the best examples. So this was an organization that was striving to pr provide services for poor women. Um, just like the YMCA still do, it provided housing, schools, it also sometimes provided medical care, and it also sometimes would house orphan children. And uh, so this was something, um, I could have easily put this on the previous slide, because this was something that also shows us women's involvement in the populist movement. But since it had a Christian emphasis, I just put it on this slide. But, you know, obviously you could talk about it just in the context of women. Um, one of the only problems, though, with the YWCA is unlike, um, unlike the WCTU, the YWCA uh, was segregated by race, and so you actually had the formation of African-American YWCAs uh, that were separate from white YWCAs. Um, so actually that was, that was formed by Baptist women who were excluded from the traditional YWCA. But nonetheless, the church is very much getting involved here. All right, so how does this actually sort of turn into a political issue? The Populist Party um, is going to start to take shape in the late 1880s. It's going to be sort of a conglomeration of 
Farmers Alliance, urban workers, um, some members of the church that are pushing the social gospel. It's going to be a party that's very much made of regular working people, right? So what's going to happen first is um, that in the 1890, we see by election because um, because it was not a presidential election. This is be this is actually right when uh, right before the Farmers Alliance merged. So the Southern Alliance and the Northern Alliance were separate. So in the 1890 by election, you actually have the Southern Alliance taking a slightly different strategy from the Northern Alliance. So the Southern Alliance wants to try to actually. Um, work directly through the Democratic Party. They feel like their interests can be solved by uh, an establishment party candidate. But the Northern Alliance actually uh, moves to support third party candidates. And what we're going to see is that's really going to be the trend that a lot of populists are going to go for. They don't really feel like their interests are being served by the Democratic Party. So what the Northern Alliance does becomes more popular. They actually basically start to emerge as a third party. In 1892, the populists are actually going to uh, organize in their first, um, they're going to have their first major uh, convention where they're going to start summarizing what their political platform is. So one could say that 1892 was the true birth of the populist party, right? So what's going to happen is first um, they're going to send 800 people to meet in St. Louis, Missouri. Most of them are alliance members. Um, what's interesting is you have a lot of African Americans who are getting involved in the Populist Party, um, but there are going to be other people who are from other um, political organizations, um, other labor unions, and you also have uh, former Rangers. You have people that supported uh, the Greenbacks. Remember this paper currency that was widely spread during the Civil War. So there, it's a, com a combination of people who, in general, are just disgruntled with the establishment politics. So the People's Party is formally born in 1892. It's going to be formed by uh, two men, James B. Weaver and, uh, and then Tom Watson. Um, James Weaver actually does run for president in 1892. Um, and even though he does not win the election, he gets almost a million popular votes. Uh, and he also, I think, gains a couple of electoral votes as well. And even though James Weaver doesn't win the election... Um, the populists actually do win several congressional seats. So what the 1892 election shows us is that the populists really were having a significant influence over the political process. So let's think about what they actually were standing for and, and how this was um, different from the Democratic and uh Republican parties, what they offered. So there were some things that, you know, that kind of, that they took from the, the establishment parties, but some things are brand new. So one of the things that they really want is to make sure that their currency is based on two different kinds of metals. The Republican party only favored a gold currency, right? So this was really problematic for people that had more silver at their disposal. So people in Western areas, um, obviously the greenbacks also don't like this idea, but yeah, they don't want a gold standard. They want a bimetal standard. They want to make sure that both gold and silver are part of the, uh, of our in circulation. And one of the reasons why this is, is because having more money in circulation actually would help farmers pay off their mortgages. Think about it. Technically it causes inflation if you have more money in circulation, but farmers had fixed rate mortgages, which meant that they owed the same amount of money no matter what was happening to the value of currency, right? So say they owed $1,000 to a bank. If suddenly there was more money in circulation, yes, the value of that currency would be defl or inflated, rather, but at the same time, that farmer would not owe any more money to the bank. So suddenly they would have more money in their hand and be able to pay it off faster. They also definitely wanted, not surprisingly, the government to start to take control of larger businesses like railroads, telephones, telegraph companies. They supported a graduated income tax, which is something that does not happen for a while, actually. Um, really not until the New Deal. Um, but that's really interesting because it shows us that they are calling out the government to place higher taxes on people who make more money, something that isn't actually adopted for a while, but still an important idea. Um, they also are very fundamentally against tariffs. They think the tariffs are only really benefiting northern manufacturing. One of the biggest tariffs that existed at this point was the McKinley Tariff of 1890, so they're really pushing to get that repealed. Um, and then they're also favoring other things that are favorable towards workers. They are campaigning towards an eight-hour workday. Um, they also want to uh, abolish the Pinkerton agencies. We know Pinkertons as these people who are hired as strike breakers. We talked about how the Pinkertons incited violence at the Homestead uh, riots. 
So anyway, um, probably not surprising that they want to get rid of those. Um, they also want to limit immigration because they find that Im um, immigrants actually further increase competition for a lot of jobs that they are trying to maintain. So a little bit of a racist element to their platform there as well. Nobody's perfect. Um, and what's interesting and what never happens is that they also want the president and vice president to have a single term. So you can see that they're not really trusting of government if they want to limit uh, the amount of time that anybody serves in office. So even though the Populist Party does not have a victory in the 1892 election, just take a moment to look at this map. This is significant, right? Um, the fact that the Populist Party actually get, a, they got 22 electoral votes. They got 5% of the electoral vote. Obviously not nearly enough to win. But they also had um, about a million uh, popular votes, which is really significant. A million out of a total of 12. Um, so this shows us really that both of the establishment parties, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is going to have to listen to the populace if it wants to maintain their votes. They know that this third party is not actually going to steal the presidency, but at the same time, we know how elections work. You have to pander towards the people that are going away from your party. So that's going to be huge. And eventually, this is really going to segue into the, pop, uh, the progressive era. Because what we're going to see is that reform starts to make its way into both establishment parties. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party are going to stay, start to take on more reform issues because of the demand from the people. But of course, it's always an issue about money, right? We know that in 1893, there's going to be a major financial panic, which uh, starts right after Grover Cleveland is elected. Um, Grover Cleveland is a Democrat, by the way. He's one of the few Democrats that actually is in office in the late 19th century. So um, in a way, it shows us that, there, like I was saying in class, there isn't a huge difference between the Democrats and Republicans um, at this point in history. But since Cleveland happens to be president when there's a financial panic, it's obviously going to uh, hurt his reputation overall. So yeah, he's only in office for 10 days and this uh, panic strikes. And so basically what happens is, first, you're going to have... Um, several really major corporations go bankrupt. Um, you're going to have railroad lines go bankrupt. Um, you're going to have over 16,000 businesses also go bankrupt. Uh, this bankruptcy is ultimately going to trigger a stock market crash because all people's investments in different corporations are now going to be worthless. People are going to start selling rapidly. Um, it's also going to cause a lot of banks to try to recall their loans. Some banks don't actually uh, have enough money to pay back um, all of their lenders, so some banks are going to close. Unemployment's going to skyrocket um, to about 3 million total. That's about 25% of the population. Um, so that's really, really significant. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically what we're going to have is that the Americans are very clearly pushing for the government to do something. But in the 1890s, the government doesn't do much, right? So basically, at this point in history, the government still tends to favor laissez-faire economics. They really don't want to intervene and regulate much. The ICC was a push for them. So this is significant because it shows us that, if anything, people are going to get that much um, more uh, unhappy with the government if they're not going to do anything about an economic panic. So basically, just a little bit of a, um, just a comic that's giving us a sense of, uh, how devastating uh, of a situation the country feels like it's in in the panic of 1893. The idea that someone is crippled in debt, the laborer who cannot get out of it. Interest is the chain that is basically holding them to the ground. They are walking on the road to pau pauperism. The idea is that the prosperity that they thought that they had enjoyed had been effectively killed in 1893. Oh, and in 1873. Notice that. It's that panic. Anyway. All right, so this is interesting as well because this shows us how farmers really feel about uh, large, wealthier people, people that actually are able to own and employ people, right? When the banker says he's broke and the merchant's up in smoke, they forget that it's the farmer who feeds them all. It would put them to a test if the farmer took a rest. Then they know that it's the farmer who feeds them all. So the idea is they still feel like the government is really paying more attention to businesses um, like manufacturing and much less to farmers. But... To them, they realize that ultimately farming is the most important business because that ultimately puts food in people's stomachs. So they're criticizing the government for ignoring them. And this is something that will come back and eventually make, cause the government to have to respond. In 1894, we're going to have a group of uh, people led by Jacob Coxey, 
form what they call an army, Coxie's army. And uh, they, uh, they ultimately are a group that is protesting on Washington. They're called Hayseed Socialists, um, just in the sense they're coming from a, a rural area, so hence Hayseed. Um, it's you know sort of grassroots socialism. It's one of the earliest examples of people that are calling for a large scale, um, large scale sort of redistribution of wealth in the country, right? So what's going to happen is that um, Jacob Coxey is going to organize this so-called army. They're going to march into Washington, D.C. in 1894, and they're going to demand relief. This army is going to be a whole bunch of unemployed populace, right? So basically, they're directly demanding the government to do something about their poverty, give them some food, give them something. Um, the army never reaches the full intended size, um, and once they reach the you know, once they reach the capital, they're going to be met with violence. Um, so what's going to happen is that the Coxie's army is going to be disbanded. It's not going to be successful in getting what they want. But in general, what Coxie's army shows us is that there really is some increased general discontent with the government, and that's only going to increase um, as we get farther into the 20th century because politicians at first are not really responding to the needs of common people. All right, so in 1894, we have a by-election. So again, it's a non-presidential year. But what's really significant to us is that just two years later, we see that there's a huge increase in people supporting populist candidates. Um, what you're going to see is that the Democratic Party is actually losing out a lot, which is significant because what's happening is that populists are actually taking the votes from the Democratic Party. Um, so by having the populist vote uh, increase by 40%, realize that a lot of those votes are coming directly from uh, the Democratic Party. But nonetheless, we know that, I don't know why this says Democrats won the control of the White House because this is not a presidential year. We know that in 1896, Republicans are going to win control of the White House. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. So that's what we're getting to, right, in 1896. So 1896, we have two candidates, um, two major candidates running against one another. Um, the Democratic challenger is uh, William Jennings Bryan. Um, he was seen as, he liked to make himself seem as though he was a representative of the common man, the great commoner. You see that uh, description down there. Um, so one of the major things that he was campaigning for was unlimited silver coinage. Right? So basically, he feels that the Republicans trying to go towards a chiefly gold standard was a disservice to especially people in the West and the South who were uh, much more in favor of supporting a silver currency. So when he becomes the silver um, candidate, populists know that he's kind of stealing their attention. Because remember, William Jennings Bryan is a Democrat. He's not a populist, right? So because the populists start to realize that, oh, wow, an establishment candidate is actually taking our position, instead of uh, conflicting with one another, in the 1896 election, the populists and the Democrats are going to join forces. And so William Jennings Bryan's uh, vice presidential candidate is Tom Watson, who was one of the founders of the populist party. So basically the idea is that they run this what's called fusion campaign, where you have both a Democrat and a populist running together. Um, but a lot of populists actually criticize the Democrats because they um, are only really pushing the silver issue. They're not working towards large-scale labor reform like the actual populist party was. So if you go back to the slide about the Omaha platform that we did before, um, realize that the Democratic Party is really not supporting most of the things on that list. Um, yeah, so basically... Um, like we were saying uh, before, the Democratic Party starts to actually absorb a lot of previous populist candidates, right? So the agrarian left is going to become Democratic for the most part. Um, a lot of them are going to, a lot of the things that they support, uh, some of them are similar to the populist, right? They want an income tax, they want to reduce tariffs, um, they want to have stronger regulation of industries like railroads, and they want free silver. But at the same time, notice that that's a smaller platform than what the Omaha platform had in the previous slide. Then you have a Republican candidate, William McKinley. Um, he is going to run a campaign that is very well financed. Um, his One of the major backers of his campaign is a man named Mark Hanna, who, um, who, also, helped, um, who also helped Grover Cleveland get elected. Um, so basically he's like this kind of, uh, he's a 
Oh, I'm sorry, not Grover Cleveland. My apologies. James Garfield. I knew that sounded wrong. So he's helped Gar he helped Garfield get elected previously. Now he's helping McKinley get elected. He is just a very efficient, very very successful um, ca uh, campaigner who's able to raise significant funds. So basically, because um, because he has such a well financed campaign, and he also is running as what's called a safe alternative to William Jennings Bryan. Um, a lot of Republicans are sort of scared of the fact that populists are getting increasingly enthusiastic with the Democratic Party. They see this as a possibility that the Democratic Party could become more um, more lawless, I guess one could say. Um, and they also fear that, you know, the the capitalism that's been in place that has made wealthy people wealthy might start to collapse if William Jennings Bryan wins. So McKinley um, also is going to favor a gold standard. So because of that, he's not going to, he actually really doesn't get any votes in the Midwest or the Far West or the Upper South because most of the people in those areas were populous and they also supported silver. But at the same time, he does get 46% of the popular vote. Um, also, a lot of traditional Democrats, um, like Catholics, are going to vote for him, which is interesting. Um, I know I said before that Catholics are... Uh, sometimes starting to join along with the populist party, but Catholics themselves were actually uncomfortable with voting for William Jennings Bryan, right? They were much more in favor of voting for a more traditional candidate. So despite the fact that, you know, in some ways McKinley may not have aligned with Catholic immigrants, uh, Catholic interests, um, a lot of them do vote for him nonetheless. And so after the election of 1896, the populist party uh, basically starts to decline. The Democratic Party becomes a minority party. It's going to remain a minority party for quite a while after this. Um, and so really the problem is that the Democratic, uh, well, that the Democratic Party um, only really was focusing on the silver issue. They're not focusing on regulation of railroads or empowering unions. So the Democratic Party is going to lose a lot of the uh, enthusiasm that they got from populists. So the populist party is going to sort of fade into the background for a while, but we're going to see a, a resurgence once we get um, about 10 years out uh, with the progressive era, which is a much larger scale uh, reform era. Um, so I'm, I don't know why. I meant to I don't really need to look at these guys. Actually, a couple of things. Um, this was Mark Hanna. So sorry, this is the guy who runs the successful campaign of of McKinley. It's called a front porch campaign because he often actually would visit people who were really important for supporting McKinley. So like I, I, the idea of traveling door to door. Um, this is William Jennings. This is a mock on William Jennings Bryan's uh, cross of gold speech. Basically, he uh, argued that uh, Republicans were chaining themselves to a cross of gold, which was incredibly corrupt. So this is sort of a play on that. Um, this is going to be uh, a play on the. Uh, this is going. This cartoon kind of shows us why certain people were unwilling to support William Jennings Bryan. The idea was that he was too new, right? Of course, this is portraying him as a baby. Um, the idea that he is maybe he has ideas that are revolutionizing the country, but he's not experienced enough to actually be a politician. Whereas the cartoon shows William McKinley dressed in his Civil War uniform because he did, he was a Civil War veteran. And uh, it's basically just saying, look, in 1861, he was fighting for his country and he's still doing it. In 1861, he was a baby and he still is a baby, right? So definitely p poking fun at William Jennings Bryan. But nonetheless, the election really isn't that far off, okay? In terms of the electoral vote, yes. McKinley clearly won the majority, but if you look at the popular vote, it's much closer than that, right? Um, so that's significant in the sense that um, look at all the states that William McKinley cannot carry, right? All of these states here are states that tend to support free silver, um, and, and a lot of these states were also states that were getting very involved in the farmers' alliances, Granger movements, right? These are people that are not going to support a Republican candidate anymore. So that's really significant for us to just take that in. The idea that, yes, McKinley becomes president, but it's not nearly as, uh, I guess, as um, as significant of a victory um, as many other elections, right? It's very, very close. So, But nonetheless, pop, uh, populism is going to enter into a period of decline by the end of the 19th century, right? So some of it is because the economy is struggling, right? With the panic of 1893, you're going to have increasing uh, skepticism about the populist party and its intentions. Like Coxey's army is a perfect example. 
I mean, these people, they're disgruntled, they're populists, and basically their movement, even though they're trying to be peaceful at first, their movement does result in violence. A lot of people start to associate populism with, you know, sort of um, lawlessness, uh, bloodthirstiness. Um, think about all these strikes that have taken place that we've discussed. The idea is that some people are kind of wary of the idea of populism. Also, some of it is just going away organically. Small farmers are becoming fewer and farther in between. Um, Large-scale agribusiness is increasingly uh, replacing the small farmers. You're also going to see that race is going to be a major divider of the of the populist party, right? You're going to have um, uh, you're going to have more uh, people actually supporting the populist party among African Americans, and you're going to have more uh, white people traditionally. Um, supporting the Democratic Party. Um, so, and also, a lot of people uh, who were populist basically aren't able to get enough people to break away from the, the established party. It's just like, you know, it's always a risk for you to vote for a third party candidate now. If you were to vote for a Green Party candidate in the general presidential election, then you might actually take votes away from another candidate that might be closer to you. That actually happened uh, quite a bit in, well, that happened in the election of 2000, for example, when uh, Ralph Nader took away many of the votes that probably otherwise would have gone to Al Gore. So it's a risk, and mo a lot of people were not willing to take that risk and vote for the Populist Party. And the last thing is that the Democratic Party takes over a lot of their agenda. So by 1896, a lot of people decide just to vote Democrat because some of the issues that populists were fighting for were things that the Democrats actually were supporting. The problem, though, is that the Democrats lose the election of 1896. So since they don't, um, since the Democrats don't win, ultimately what's going to happen is the populists don't really get much of their agenda accomplished either. So in any case, that is giving us a sense of the populist era. Um, hopefully that was straightforward enough. I'm also going to give you my notes from chapter 20, which will help you study. Um, and then in class tomorrow, we can talk about uh, the Jim Crow era and imperialism. Thanks so much. See ya.